Let's find out a little more about it. I think we need to uh, from uh, Fraunhofer to find out how they've implemented that within their software. And then also about some research to see how different methods of dialogue enhancement can work. In this session, Amy Molson from Fraunhofer IIS and Ian McClanahan from BBC R&D. Hi everyone. Yep, thank you for the introduction there. So my name is Amy Molson. I'm a sound engineer here at IIS and um, I'm here to talk to you today about unmixing, having your cake and the ingredients. So what we're going to talk about today. So initially we'll go through what is dialogue separation, just in general across uh, different technologies and why perhaps we it, it can be useful and why we, we, we would need it. Before I'll then talk to you about um, Fraunhofer's Dialog Plus algorithm, um, the tools that we have, uh, some trials that we've undertaken, and a quick demo of um, uh, of our tools. Before I will hand over to Ian, who will talk you through his interesting research uh, into dialog separation that he's been doing with the BBC. So let's start. So what is dialog separation? So in the most general terms and the most general uh, way of saying it would be that the, it gives the ability, the user the ability to boost the dialogue relative to the background. This could be achieved in many different ways um, with many different technologies, but there are kind of various methods, uh, three various methods to use. Um, frequency based, this is where technologies kind of hone in on what typical frequency bands um, speech can be associated with. Um, object based, uh, sorry, my poster is about to fall down behind me. <laughs> oh, well, uh, object based and dialogue extraction. So um, this uh, object based and dialogue extraction <laughs> can be um, uh, associated, for example, dialogue extraction with legacy based content, um, extracting a speech from that file. So why do we need it? Well, as you may be may all know, um, over the years, there's been um, many problems uh, with understanding dialogue in TV. Um, audibility is the single biggest topic of viewer complaints with the BBC, according to the DTG. And um, really, there's multiple factors that affect speech intelligibility. You can't really hone it down to one. And there's been lots of um, lots of development and concern on the recording and post-production side into how best that we can um, improve that for TV. But ultimately, Having a second kind of um, control for the user just allows more users to interact and consume content, but also um, in different scenarios. So, for example, accessibility benefits, so people who are hard of hearing, but also noisy people who are just in noisy environments. I mean, for example, when you're on the train going to work in the morning and you're trying to watch the morning TV, um, it doesn't matter how much you turn up the, the volume button, sometimes when something's just noisy in the background, you just can't quite hear that speech. Um, so this is where Dialog Plus or Dialog Separation can be um, useful. So I'll now talk you through uh, our work at Fraunhofer. So um, we've been for about 10 years now in Fraunhofer IIS, we've been researching and developing dialog enhancement technologies for broadcast and streaming services. Oh dear, dear, there it goes completely. <laughs> um, uh, these developments are also closely connected with our object-based audio codec, um, MPEG-H, which you may be aware of. And in fact, object-based audio enables accessibility features which are not possible for legacy audio co codecs. Sorry. So let's take you through um, how we do this. So we're fully aware that many broadcast workflows aren't working with object-based audio currently. And if you have a legacy file or legacy stereo content, it's, we can still extract um, and use it with Dialog Plus using the Dialog Plus algorithm. So the key technology here is deep neural network technology. So the algorithm was trained to listen for what is a background sound. So for example, bed sounds and what is foreground sounds such as speech. So we trained the algorithm for um, over hundreds of hours of movies, and we were able, the algorithm was then able to, to identify these foreground and background uh, sounds, and it splits it out from the stereo file into two separate um, audio files with your background and your foreground. So then, once we have the separated, we need to put it back uh, together somehow. So in the second step, the separate foreground, bound, ground, and background are remixed into this new audio version. And um, this can be done statically by attenuating the bed, dynamically, or a combination of both. But the dynam dyna 
sorry, but the dynamic approach has the benefit that the audio um, is mix is only touched when the speech is present. The rest of the time, the audio mix isn't affected. And we call this adaptive background attenuation. And you can kind of think of this a bit like side chain compression. So, uh, so there's two ways of outputting the file. So we have your standard channel-based stereo mix for today's broadcasts, which would be, for example, for legacy video on demand services. But also if you wanted to deliver object-based audio, we have the option for uh, ADM. And ADM stands for audio definition model. And um, this allows us to contain not only the audio, but all kinds of metadata, like interactivity options, down mix parameters, dynamic range control data. And here, um, the separated dialogue and background are contained as audio objects. So uh, on your left-hand side of your screen, you will see the Dialog Plus demonstrator tool. This was developed by Fraunhofer, uh, by us, Fraunhofer here, and um, it does exactly what it says in the tin. It demonstrates the, the use of the algorithm. So you put in the stereo file, it does the separating, the remixing, and uh, gives you, provides you with a Dialog Plus enhanced uh, file. But on the right hand side of your screen, we partnered with the Minnetonka Audio Tools server. Uh, you may know Minnetonka, they're well known for their um, loudness technologies and developments. And um, in this Audio Tools server, it has the Dialog Plus um, module using this algorithm, but it also has the MPEG H authoring module. So if you wanted to do um, object based audio workflows, you have that ability too. So we undertook a few trials here in Germany um, with public broadcasters. Uh, See if that works. There we go. Um, with WDR and BR, and the trials were tested over HPB TV and DVBS, respectively. So we conducted an online survey with with WDR with over two thousand participants, asking them various questions about um, about uh, uh, the the usefulness and how they liked uh, to use uh, Dialog Plus in their services. So um, they listened to a variety of content: drama, sports, documentaries. Um, and provided useful feedback. Um, just due to time constraints, I'll just show you uh, just one of the slides. Um, but um, on, when asked the question, do you, do you like the possibility to switch to Dialog Plus? Over 83% um, liked that opportunity and the possibility to do so. And it's interesting to note that even younger users who in previous questions said that they didn't necessarily need dialogue uh, separation or dialogue enhancement, still liked the option to, to have it, to have the option to turn it on or off. So I'll now show you a quick demo. Um, the demo is going to talk you through very quickly just the, dialogue, the Fraunhofer dialogue demonstration tool. Um, it will show you how to author it, but also listen out to some examples of um, what the algorithm is doing um, to the speech and bed separation. So here we go. Welcome everyone to this quick start tutorial. In this video, we present to you the MPEG H Dialog Plus demonstrator. It is a standalone software for Windows and Mac developed by Fraunhofer IIS. The MPEG H Dialog Plus demonstrator automatically creates a new audio version with cleaner dialog out of any existing stereo broadcast mix. Here we have an original mix with speech that is hard to understand due to the loud background music. Das eine Kultur erschaffen hat, die tausende Jahre alt ist. Zum Teil unter Extrembedingungen. Now, let's listen to the same excerpt after processing. Dass eine Kultur erschaffen hat, die tausende Jahre alt ist. Zum Teil unter Extrembedingungen. As you can hear, the background sounds are clearly attenuated compared to the original mix. Dass eine Kultur erschaffen hat, die tausende Jahre alt ist. Dass eine Kultur erschaffen hat, die tausende Jahre alt ist. In the next part of this video, we will show you how to quickly create such a Dialog Plus audio version. The first step is to open the app and drag and drop your audio file into it. The input format is a 48 kHz stereo WAV file, 16 and 24 bit are supported. Now click Process. The processing status is shown in a progress bar. First, the dialog is being separated from the rest of the mix using our deep learning based dialog separation algorithm. In a second processing step, the separated audio is remixed to a new audio file with cleaner dialog. Finally, two Dialog Plus audio files are exported. One is the legacy stereo mix with enhanced dialog and attenuated background. 
the mix is automatically normalized to your desired target loudness. The other output is an ADM broadcast wave file comprising a complete MPEG-H scene authoring. This can be directly encoded to MPEG-H, offering all features of object-based audio as user interactivity or universal delivery. Furthermore, you can directly play it back and edit it with the free MPEG-H audio production tools. More information about the MPEG-H production suite are presented in our MPEG-H production tools tutorial series. The link can be found in the video description. We hope you enjoyed this short video. If you like the tool, please watch the next tutorial video, where the settings of the Dialog Plus demonstrator are explained in detail. You can also visit our website and subscribe to the Fraunhofer IIS audio blog. Thank you for watching. Yeah, so there you go. That's that's everything from me. Um, if you have, if you'd like to see anything or find anything more out, um, my contact details on screen, and you can look at the web, uh, the following links and websites. So I'll now hand over to Ian, who will go through um, his research. Thanks, Amy. Uh, good to be at our Angel Life separation demo on your wall for us. <laughs> um, so we just oh, here we go. Yeah, so I'm Ian McLennan. I'm a graduate research development engineer at BBC R&D, and I'm currently working on um, looking at the accessibility effects of dialogue enhancement technologies. So there are multiple different technologies that exist to perform dialogue enhancement. And Currently, the data surrounding these shows that they can be preferable in open comparisons. So that's where people have been provided with the original mix and a processed mix. They tend to prefer the processed mix. And that's good, but I think that that isn't the same as asking if they can improve accessibility. And I'm trying to more directly look at an answer to that question. So when I'm considering accessibility, I've split that up into three measures. Um, clarity, and that's to do with, you know, could somebody actually understand the word that was spoken? Quality, you know, is the immersion being maintained? And also effort, what was the cognitive load um, on somebody to understand the, uh, the dialogue? And I think all of these things together uh, are important to consider. So as an overview of where my research has been going, I started off looking at the different dialogue enhancement technologies uh, that were candidates for uh, being evaluated, and then put together an initial comparative test where I was trying to establish whether these uh, technologies can be differentiated from a control. And what I'm currently working on is uh, an experiment to more directly measure the effect they have on accessibility. And I'll be presenting to you the, the results of the comparative test. So this test, I wanted to find out whether these technologies could improve clarity, whether they could uh, preserve quality, and also whether they were able to be differentiated from unprocessed audio and also having the volume turned up as well. So to do that, we used two different blind source separation technologies. We also included a manual foreground background mix. So that was a during production approach made by a sound engineer to be an accessible mix. And then we also included um, the original audio, but boosted in volume, because uh, that, that's the option most people currently have available to them and wanted to see if that made any difference as well for people. So to do this, I took clips out of the BBC drama Casualty, just a hospital drama. I took segments where the speech was masked by background noise and then processed each of those using the dialogue enhancement technologies. I then got participants to rank these audio stimuli in order of clarity and the perceived audio quality. So this was just an internal uh, trial as an initial thing to get a feel for how these technologies work. I got 26 participants involved and that resulted in 520 total rankings per technology. So for the results, 
I know that's quite a lot of information to take in, but in a short amount of time. Uh, but this is the distributions of rankings um, for the different technologies. So the clarity rankings are in blue and the quality rankings are in orange. So what you can see is there's a bump at the first ranking, that being the highest for the manual method, which isn't that much of a surprise given that it's lossless and a sound engineer took their time to make it. But what's also interesting is if you look at the blue profiles, all of the dialogue enhancement technologies improved clarity. And that's with a statistical confidence uh, of, well, a very high one. Um, what you can also see is the first blind source separation method uh, has the same quality distribution as the original audio. Um, and the second blind source separation method increases clarity more significantly, but that that can be at the expense of some of the quality, which shows that there is a bit of a balance. What's also interesting is the clarity profile of the volume boosted stimuli is the same as the original audio, showing that that didn't provide a measurable increase in clarity. You can see a bit of a bump in the quality ratings for the volume boosted stimuli. Uh, that wasn't actually statistically significant enough to make any firm conclusions, but it does make sense that turning the volume up um, improved the quality for some people. So looking at how to compare these different technologies, I went through a variety of methods. If you just look at the uh, frequency with which they were ranked first, you can see a clear um, result for the manual method, followed by the second blind source separation method for quality, that is, sorry, clarity. And for quality, um, you can see it's the manual method followed by turning up the volume. But that's not the full picture because just choosing the most frequently rated first um, things doesn't give you uh, an overall picture of how something performs for everybody. Someone could love it, but another person could hate it. So instead, I thought about it as if it was an election and tried to pick a most favorable method using uh, a method called the the border score. But what actually happened was the same results came out um, with a closer, there was less in it, but um, the, the results were the same for clarity and for quality. So then you can't separate quality and clarity when you're putting something together, they're both present uh, and you have to decide on a trade-off between the two. So I made this, uh, kind of linear combination interactive graph where you can decide what balance you want to have. So this is a screenshot of an equal weighting between clarity and quality. And you can see that it's a pretty close tie for second place for the blind source separation methods, manuals again in first place. But throughout all of these, there is an improvement um, from all the dialogue enhancement technologies. So. As a conclusion of this experiment, um, the during production approach does have significantly better results, but that comes with overhead. You have to get somebody to do all of that and it won't necessarily work on archive material. The blind source separation methods do increase clarity. There can be a risk of affecting quality, but there is a balance where that can be uh, maintained. It shows that increasing the volume isn't a very useful method for people to understand uh, dialogue better, but some people do perceive an increase in quality. And I think it's worth noting that there's also some split on how people rank quality. People have different things that are important to them, and it shows that you need to be flexible in however you deliver something like this. The same settings aren't going to please everybody or be appropriate for everybody. I want to make a caveat here that this experiment isn't looking at accessibility. This is just an initial look to see if they were differentiable from nothing. And my second experiment is looking more directly at accessibility. So this is currently underway. I'm recruiting for it right now. And what I'm doing is directly assessing the impact on accessibility, not just for deaf and hard hearing individuals, but I'm also looking at the impact on neurodivergent audiences as I think this is a, an area that's not been studied adequately, and I think there could be benefits. I am going to be looking at the effect on word recognition rate 
but also trying to establish if there's an effect on cognitive load and audio quality as well. And I'm hoping to show if these technologies will directly benefit the audiences with access needs that are currently underserved. And hopefully I'll be able to present the results of this in the next couple of months. So thanks very much. Thank you very much. OK, delegates, what question would you like to ask our two contributors, Amy and uh, Ian, this morning? What would you like to ask about what you've heard in the last 20 minutes? Please put your hand up as quickly as you can. When we come to you, make sure you've got your camera and your microphone on. Otherwise, well, you know what will happen if you don't do that. So please put your hand up and we'll get to you uh, very uh, shortly. Ian, you, you say a couple of months, so that uh, research is, is, is you're expecting it fairly soon. Yeah, well, as I said, yeah, the experiment is is underway of um, actively recruiting people to take part in it. So um, then it will just be a, a matter of analysing the results and getting them together. Amy, are, are there any uh, Dialogue Plus experiments? You've got your microphone muted at the moment. There we are. Are, are there any experiments in the UK uh, at the moment? Currently, no. So we we uh, this was our first trial in, in Germany with the public broadcasters. But um, currently, we're kind of looking for uh, other broadcasters or UK-based um, uh, content creators to to partner with um, to to do some more tests. So yeah. Okay, let's get our first question. A familiar face. It's uh, Nick Piggott. Nick should zoom in from Planet Earth. Hello. Good morning, Nick. Your question. Um, really, really interesting, and it's such a uh, hot topic at the moment, the issue of audibility of dialogue, uh, particularly in the TV domain, um, and uh, the the approach of using kind of stacked neural networks to pick that back out is really, really smart. Um, is it likely to be achievable on a piece of consumer electronics equipment like a radio, like a digital radio, which has generally got a bit less... Uh, processing power and a bit less memory footprint. Um, is it something, for instance, you could see being useful in uh, what we would call a tabletop radio, or is it applicable in uh, a car radio where there are also uh, quite challenging noise thresholds to make things legible, particularly telephone calls, particularly telephone calls? Sure, yeah, I can I can take that one. Um, so from in terms of the, the actual processing side, we do that on pre-transmission. So that will, that is done, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, that is done um, from the broadcaster. And then the stereo file is just simply sent out um, to the to the user. Of course, there would be needed to be some kind of decoder or some kind of feature that would enable a second button um, to turn the file on. Um, but yeah, in terms of in terms of processing, it wouldn't be too much more um, to use, yeah. But it does. It needs the broadcaster to kind of pre-produce that, so it's it's more relevant for pre-recorded material than live material. Sure. So currently, um, yes, it would be more useful for pre-recorded material. Um, we are looking into um, the possibility of doing a real-time um, tool, so that it could just be um, placed somewhere in the in the broadcast chain, and just yep. everything can be processed through it. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Nick, thank you for uh, asking that question. And uh, please be poised with your questions just so we can get to you in, in future as quickly as possibly can. Uh, Amy, Ian, fascinating stuff. Thank you very much indeed for joining us at TechCon 2021. And I know delegates are already anxious to, uh, to get in touch with you. Some really thought-provoking stuff.